Hello, this video and the accompanying slides are intended only for those schools that use the SPEDFORMS MA Billing Service. The list of those schools are at the end of these slides. In this video, if you do wish to turn on the closed caption for the video, you can use the CC button while viewing the video from that YouTube site. Clicking on that gear icon to the right of the CC button will allow you to change the language and update a few other settings. So this will be information for schools, providers, MA coordinators, and directors using SPEDFORM's MA billing service. We'll cover switching to version 2. Everything in the training will be in version 2, looking at your dashboard, ICD-10 codes, customizing dropdowns, evaluation and activity logs, and an educator or for provider MA services report. And then we'll review some information for the MA contacts at the schools or MA coordinators. And then we'll also look at just a couple of reports um, for directors or special ed directors. So we're going to go ahead and switch to version 2 if you haven't already been doing that. We do want to let you know that the update scheduled for January 6th will be retiring version 1 of MA forms. This doesn't mean you are required to switch to version 2 if you are using version 1. It just means if you are navigating in SPED forms using version 1, when you go to MA forms, you are only going to see those in version 2. So if you're in version one and want to turn on version two now, you can go to your educator setup. If you're on the main menu, it'll be the button in the upper left-hand corner. Or if you're not on your main menu, you can use your go-to menu in the upper right-hand corner and select educator setup. Then you're gonna select profile. And then in the lower left-hand corner of your profile, there'll be a settings section. This is where you will see the version dropdown and you can select SPEDFORMS 2.0. Once you've selected and saved the page, the page will immediately update. And gone are those blue and green colors and you'll see more white and grays. You'll have a left bar menu, which is the navigation, the new navigation. Um, instead of having that upper right hand go to drop down menu, you're going to have a left bar menu. If you happen to have a narrower screen, a smaller laptop, or maybe you're on a tablet, that left bar menu might collapse or be hidden. There are three little lines in the upper left hand corner that we'll show you on the next slide. Um, that will open that menu. So down at the bottom, if you are newer and on a smaller device and you want to keep that left bar menu open until you know what some of those icons are, at the very bottom of your profile, there's an option to keep the hamburger menu open, which is that left bar menu. You also have an option of a default landing page. So if you're one of the MA service providers and you 90% of the time you come in to document your MA activities, maybe you always want to land on your MA dashboard. There are some other options, of course, your SPED dashboard, um, your regular educator menu. If you're an administrator, you'll have additional options as well. So now we're going to take a look at working with your MA dashboard. So again, that left bar menu those three horizontal lines at the top, we call the hamburger icon and that hamburger menu. So the left bar menu will have labels if it's collapsed. If you hover over them, if you're using a mouse, if you're using a tablet, you can't hover, you'll have to click on the hamburger icon and you can open or expand using the hamburger icon or just click on the icon for the MA dashboard. We do have filters, which we'll discuss on the next slide, but in order to update those, that left bar menu does need to be expanded. So maybe you're sitting on your MA dashboard for the first time and you are missing 
kids that you normally see on your SPED dashboard. This most likely the reason you are not seeing them is an MA administrator has not given you access to that student. So the first thing the MA dashboard looks at is if you have MA permissions to a student. We can't show you medical information unless you have MA access. So if you aren't seeing students, you will have to contact the administrator at your school or if you're one of the schools that use us as your billing service, you would contact Kelly or Tanya if you can't find your administrator. So again, just due to HIPAA, plan managers are not able to provide MA access unless they themselves are an MA administrator. So why don't you see any logs for students on the dashboard? Well, again, those filters, just like on your special ed dashboard, you might be preventing students from being displayed. So here is where you would double check the I have MA access, which is the least restrictive option. If you were to choose I am a provider and you don't have any logs for that student, they're not going to show up. If you are choosing you have it, you are the supervisor, so you're an OT over a CODA, then you might not see the logs in which you're a provider. So again, just double check those filters to make sure they're the least restrictive and you're seeing what you need to see. So the students on the MA dashboard, it's very similar to your SPED dashboard with the name and the school, but instead of the IEP date, the evaluation date, the birth date, we're going to show you the service, a current log, and the last log. The navigation is also different. When you click on a student on your SPED dashboard, you go to the SPED forms menu. But instead on the MA dashboard, you're going to go to that activity log list. We're going to allow you to sort by name and school and not service log or last log because there could be multiple in each row for the multiple services that you might be providing. Clicking on that gear icon, if you see it, will bring you directly to the MA billing setup, not the SPED form setup. The current log is going to be your most recent unfinalized activity log. That more than likely is the current month that you're working on. The last log is going to be your most recent finalized activity log. So last month's log that you're finished with, you've finalized. And if you have electronically signed it, you will see that S indicator. If you were to click, remember, if you click on the row, you're going to go to the activity log list. But if you click on the plus log button, it's going to bring you directly to a brand new activity log. By clicking on these dates, which are the log dates, will bring you immediately to that specific log. So the first thing you need to do when you're going to document on a student is every claim needs an ICD-10 code. So if you're looking at your dashboard and you clicked on the student name, it's going to bring you to the activity log list. So in version 2, you have options of breadcrumbs at the top of the page or that left bar menu if you're keeping it open and you would select MA forms. Once you're on the MA forms menu, the main MA forms menu, the ICD-10 code setup is in the service documentation folder. So you might have to click on that to expand it to get to the ICD-10 code setup. You would then click plus code at the top of the page if you're adding a brand new code for a new student. When adding a new code, the district is going to default to the student's current district. You will then have to select a service. Each service, even an eval and a direct service for speech therapy, both services will need an ICD-10 code. You might evaluate a student in two, three areas, but they only qualify in one. So this way you can have three codes attached to an eval, but only one attached to a service. You can add as many as needed for the student, but one will have to be selected as the primary. 
You're also going to select a start date, which has to be on or before the first date of service. Now you're going to enter the code, select the code from a list of drop downs that you may have added, or use the CMS select code option. We'll look at that select code option, which is just going to expand a list below in that ICD-10 code setup. And these are all of the CMS available codes. Every October, CMS does update this list. So if there is a code that you have been using in years past, it is possible after October of every year that that code might be made in, inactive. So as you click through the codes, you, if there is a chapter that has a down arrow, you can keep expanding the list until the arrow is up, meaning it's fully expanded and there's no more available codes under that area. Once you've reached a billable code, it's in blue and it has an arrow to the right. So we'd allow you to insert 4701, R4701, but we will not allow you to insert R470. So again, as you keep expanding the drop down arrows until you get to one that is a billable code, you can then insert it into the ICD-10 code setup page. You can also create your own custom li list. So if there are ones that you use frequently, when you click on that drop down arrow, you'll have an edit option. It will then open up a pop-up and you can enter the code and the display. This is one of the only exceptions to our rule of creating custom drop downs where the value stored is going to be different than, than the display. Go ahead and enter the code in value stored and then in value display in the display column will be the description of that code. Even if you don't use capital letters or include the period in the code, we are gonna format that once added to remove the periods and capitalize letters. This is just the way DHS requires it in the uh, file when we bill. And again, the display, you might incorrectly type something, but we're going to update that after you save the page and include the description from CMS. So once you've selected it, manually entered, um, which those would be the only options. If you selected from the CMS code list, more than likely it'll be okay. But if you manually entered it or you have an incorrect code, once you've saved the page, you might have a warning. Um, recently, again, last October, every October, we update those CMS codes and the code might no longer be billable. Maybe you transposed the numbers and it might be an invalid code. Maybe the code was added, but you forgot to check the primary code. And every service needs a primary ICD-10 code. That's a DHS thing, not a SpedForms thing. So select primary code if this is the only code and the primary code. So now we're going to take a look at the other dropdown on the activity log, which is the description. So when you click edit, in that description dropdown, this is where the value stored is going to be exactly as the, val as the display column. So both columns are gonna have the same text. And just to note, if you use capital C, capital H, capital L, capital D, missing the I, child, without the I, it will insert that student's name in the dropdown. Additionally, if you have to be on an activity log in order to update your dropdown, but when you go to your next student, the options that you added here are going to be available on every student that you go to. So that's why you would not type the actual child's name in the dropdown. You would type capital C-H-L-D. 
So now we're going to take a look at an evaluation log. So if a new student's been referred to you, you might see something looking like this on your MA dashboard, the top screenshot. Or if a student's due for their three-year reevaluation, it might look like this bottom screenshot where there was a previous log. So if you click this plus log, the service may default to the direct speech service or direct OT service if that is your default service on your setup. Or if you were to click this bottom one, it will create an activity log for that type of service. So we're going to go ahead and click plus log. The log date may be the date of the evaluation. However, this is not the date that is sent to VHS. For an evaluation, there is only one date of service for the full and completed evaluation that gets sent to VHS. So once we add activity, um, we'll explain a little more about those dates. But the log date um, is recommended to be at least a date in the month that you're doing the evaluation. Because we selected the plus log for a student that already had an eval, this type of service defaulted to an evaluation. And then we would suggest clicking the autofill times in this log if it didn't already select. Then you're going to verify the enrolled school and district and the providing district. The enrolled district and school cannot be updated. Um, the providing service, the providing district can. This is the district that is going to receive the money for this evaluation. So this is the one that has to be correct. If for some reason the school, the student may have moved to another district or another school, this is where you would have to contact your administrator at the school and ask them to do an update on the student setup we would delete this log and then you would create a new one and then they would have to return the student back to um, their current school. Your name is going to default as the first provider on the log because you are the one that created it. If there are other providers that assisted in the evaluation of the same type of service, if there were multiple speech therapists, you would add them down here in the provider section. Or if you have a supervisor, they would be they could be added to the log here. These are the only staff that will be able to electronically sign the activity log once it's been finalized. So once you've reviewed everything on the activity log, you can go ahead and click plus activity. Now we're down to more dates. The service date is the date that gets billed to DHS. And again, DHS only allows one date per completed evaluation. For the speech therapist, the OT would complete their own evaluation log. The school psychologist would complete their own evaluation log, but one date of service. This is the date we are going to bill DHS. The settings should default as the school. If not, select school. If it does happen to be telemedicine, we'll review some of those options later, but for this example, we're using school. Then you're going to click the plus time button, and you'll click plus time as many dates and times that you need to document that evaluation. So if there's four or five dates because you had two or three tests, maybe you got so far into evaluating and you had to do another test or another assessment. So each date, start and end time, we will calculate all of the time and include it in this one main service date. And that service date for SPED forms, if we are your MA billing service, we do not care whether it is the date you submitted the report to the team or the date of the ER meeting. Either one will work. DHS doesn't care. Um, SPED Forms doesn't care what date that is. Um, if you're doing 
making it as accurate as possible. It might be a Saturday or Sunday because that's the last time you touched the evaluation report and submitted it to the team. These dates in the evaluation notes are the dates you actually did the activities. So once you have everything entered, you can go ahead and save or validate the activity log. And just as a note, those ICD-10 codes that you added will be listed at the bottom of the activity log. So once you've saved, there might be yellow and pink messages on the activity log. Errors are in pink. These are errors that will prevent finalization. In yellow, these are just warnings, and they will not prevent you from finalizing that activity log or SPED forms from billing it. Um, the messages are initially collapsed, so you would have to just click on that little down chevron button, and that will expand it and let you know specifically what is incorrect and needs to be fixed. So if there's not an ICD-10 code, you could go back to the ICD-10 code setup page, add your code, come back to the activity log, and you will have to validate. Because we don't want to update those ICD-10 codes immediately when codes are changed, that's why we would have to revalidate. Maybe you forgot a start and end time. Maybe um, you didn't click the autofill times on this log and forgot to click the calculator button so the time totals zero. Um, just click the little calculator to calculate the total minutes. Infra error messages and warnings that don't prevent finalization if you are doing that eval on a weekend date will warn you DHS doesn't care if it's provided on a weekend you're doing that report writing on a Saturday or Sunday, or it's not an instructional day, which could be a weekend, or your school isn't entering the calendar days in SPED forms. It could be either or, um, but that will not prevent finalization. Possibly, um, if you ended up having to do two or three assessments, you might have a message that says the minutes are too high. Again, it's just a warning but maybe recheck those dates and times just in case you had an AM-PM mix-up and it's taking, it's calculating 700 and some odd minutes instead of 70 minutes. So just verify if you do see that warning. Once all of the errors are corrected, you will then have that option to finalize the log. SPED forms doesn't require it to be finalized, but finalizing helps you organize your activity log list and know that you're done for that month. It also allows us to build the log sooner. SPED forms will eventually build that activity log. If it's nearing the one year expiration date, it's error free and we will bill it. There are a couple of exceptions um, later on in the slides. So go ahead and click Finalize. We also do not require you to electronically sign the activity log, but one of the questions that was asked was, is it best practice? And we would agree it is. Once it's electronically signed, if you did notice something needs to be corrected, we can reactivate that activity log for you and you can re-sign it if necessary. Again, not required to do this process. It is a couple of clicks, but it does allow us to bill sooner and it is best practice to electronically sign that log. And you do not have to put a comment in the history um, for the activity log. And you can just close the signature audit trail. So now we're gonna take a look at a direct service activity log. From your dashboard, again, clicking on that current log, if you're documenting maybe weekly, you could go ahead and click on the log date. Or if you were finished with last month and you're documenting monthly, um, today is November 1st when I'm recording this video, you would go and you want to document October's and 
September is already done, you would click that plus log button. If you did have a previous log or you have a default service, that date of service is going to default. Also, if you do have that default service, the autofill times in this log button is going to automatically be selected. So the log date is probably the first thing you're going to look at and may want to change. It's going to default to the current date. So if it, this happens to be November 1st, it would default to that date but you are going to be documenting October services. We would suggest updating that to October 1st, October 31st, um, at least a day in the month that you're documenting. Because that activity log list becomes your quote unquote file folder for the student, you wanna see all of the October services when you click on the October log. It just helps helps keep things in order. So then again, the type of service autofill times on this log if it isn't selected already. Here again, just like with the evaluation log, you're going to be looking at that enrolled district and school and the providing district. If it's incorrect, you're going to contact the school, have them update that information, and then would probably delete this log and you'd create a new one. And remember that the district providing the service is the one who's going to get the money for this claim. The provider, again, is going to default to you who is logged into SPED forms. If you do have a supervisor, OT CODA situation, PTPTA, um, as of this recording, SLPAs are not a billable service provider according to DHS at this time. So select a supervisor if you do need one or multiple providers. Multiple providers, again, SPED Forms doesn't care when you're documenting whether you and the other speech therapist document on the same log or different logs. Um, you can do it either way. SPED forms will make sure and calculate behind the scenes all of the services provided on the same date by all of the speech providers and count it as one encounter because that's the way DHS requires it. So after you have everything correct on your log details, now we're going to take care of entering that service. So the date of service is the label that says service date. This is what's going to get billed to DHS. Then you're going to select the setting. It should default to school, but we will take a look at telemedicine options next. But if you do need to change that, you could update that here. Then you're going to type or select the description of services. And just as a reminder, the student's outcomes from the IFSP or the goals and objectives from the IEP from the current working plan will be included in the description dropdown. Um, if you are documenting when the student was absent, SPED Forms does not require you to do this, but if you are, or if you're documenting indirect time um, conversations with the student's gen ed teacher, or their case manager, plan manager, you can go ahead and document that, but make sure and mark it not billable if it's not a direct service with the student. Then you can go ahead and click the plus time button. Then a start and end time group size and total time will be added to the activity. Here's where you can just type in and tab, type in tab. Um, in version two, it's definitely much easier than version one type in tab, and if you did not select autofill times in this log, the time will calculate after you add the start and end time and group size. But if you didn't, click the calculator button if you do not get a total time. Then you'll see the ICD-10 codes um, if you've added them to the ICD-10 code setup page. If you did not and you have to go back and add them when you come back to the log, just remember you have to revalidate. 
then if you are, if this is the beginning of October and you saw the students seven more times that month, in this duplicate text box, you're going to enter seven. And if you see them on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you would check those days of the week. If you check nothing, we'll duplicate for seven days on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you're documenting monthly, adding that first date of the month and duplicating for the remainder days of the month goes pretty quickly. Once the dates are added, you can adjust the start and end times or the descriptions if you have percentages or progress that you need to note um, in that description area. And then you can go ahead and save the page. Now we will take a look at the telemedicine options. If you make a change to the setting and choose telehealth or telehealth student at home, recently DHS did add a second option, and 10 is when the student is at home. So maybe they are in a virtual school or maybe they're quarantined at home for some reason, um, then you would choose 10. If they're at school or any other location other than home, you would choose two. Once you do make that change to the setting, your page is going to blink and update. That's when it's going to add the telehealth elements down at the bottom below the start and end time. This is where you would select the mode, which might be Google Meet, Zoom, or whatever platform your school is using the provider location and the student location. DHS does not need a specific address. They just need to know that the provider is at their school office or their home office. And the student location could be the school speech room, the school ITV room, whatever it happens to be, or student at home if you selected telehealth 10 student at home. Once you're complete for that month, you can go ahead and click finalize. Again, we don't require it, but we would strongly suggest that you do finalize that activity log. It just verifies that everything is correct. It's you telling us that you are finished with that activity log and it can be submitted for billing. Again, here are some examples of errors in pink that are preventing finalization. Just click that little down arrow to open it up and it will give you the specific reasons it cannot be finalized. Or warnings. Warnings are in yellow and you'll still have the option to finalize even if you do have some of those warnings. Um, can't log in the future. Um, you might have some missing information on the activity log. You might be missing ICD-10 codes. You might not have a primary. Those are examples of errors that prevent finalization. Again, not on an instructional day. Your school doesn't have their calendar days entered. Um, maybe you have some minutes that are too high. Again, if you get that one, I would suggest looking on that claim line. There will be a message on that particular claim line that is in that has that warning as well. Just verify you don't have an AM PM situation um, or you entered the incorrect time and it's just calculating again something like 750 minutes instead of 70 minutes or 30 minutes. So again, not required to finalize, but we would strongly suggest that you do that. Once you've finalized, you're going to have the option to electronically sign, just like on that evaluation activity log. Again, not required. If you cannot finalize that activity log and you really want to, and you're having trouble, just go ahead and let Kelly or myself, Tanya, know um, and we can take a look at that and help you figure out what's happening, why you cannot finalize that activity log. 
Once it's been billed, we still do allow you to make corrections if needed. If you're not able to reactivate that log, again, just contact Kelly or Tanya. So that activity log list, we're going to take a look at that. Um, one of the questions was, would they still be able to see those columns in version two? Nothing should be any, we'll show it to you differently, but all of the same information that you had in version one is available in version two. Just know that as the screen gets more narrow, one of the first columns that disappears is going to be billed. Then it might be finalized, validated, signed. I forget the order in which they disappear if the screen is too narrow. You have search options at the top of your activity log list. And once you make changes to these options, you do have to click that search button to apply those filters. So just like you're completing a search in a report, you have to click search. Maybe uh, for video Valerie here, she wants to see only her speech therapy logs and only logs that are not finalized because once she finalizes them, they're ready for billing and she doesn't want to see them anymore. She only wants to see her most current logs at the top of the list. And maybe she only wants to see a particular date. She's only looking for this current school year. So again, if you change any of your search, op search options, just make sure and click that search button. So just to recap, um, whether you should finalize or not, we would definitely recommend finalizing them and electronically signing them. Just know that if there are logs out there that are not finalized and there are no errors, and it's nearing one year from the date of service, SPED Forms is going to submit those claims because we do not want your school to miss out on revenue. One exception, currently Lakes International Language Academy does require logs to be finalized before we can bill them. If, there's, if there are errors on the MA logs, SPED Forms will contact the provider directly. Again, this is for schools using our MA billing service. We do not require you to electronically sign that activity log. In the past, there is a date timestamp. That date timestamp is still there on each individual claim line. So before COVID and the big electronic signature craze, we ran that date timestamp by DHS and MDE, and it did suffice as an electronic signature to them. The new updated signature process has been approved by lawyers and our HIPAA officer. So it just is a more um, formal signature process. We would recommend documenting monthly if you are unable to finalize or have any questions about your activity logs, you can contact T Kelly or myself, Tanya. If you do not have that MA eligible filter, again, contact Kelly or myself. And just as a reminder, SPED forms cannot determine those ICD-10 codes for you. Um, DHS does suggest using that R chapter, the signed symptoms and condition codes. So if you are hesitant to use a formal diagnosis code, um, looking in that R chapter uh, would be suggested by DHS. So at the end of the month, end of the year, maybe during Christmas, as an educator service provider, if you go to educator reports, go to searchable, which should be the first list of reports that pop up, the very last option in the searchable reports is MA services. A start date, end date, 
and district is required. So if you are a service provider that does serve more than one school, you will have to restrict the report to only one district because we're checking a lot of information in the background. The main thing being that you still have MA access to the student. Even if you entered an activity log and for some reason you no longer have access to that student, you no longer have access to that activity log. Um, the student may have moved, but you no longer have access to that student, so we do not want you to see that information. So again, this is where you could go to check for logs that you haven't finalized or logs that you may not have signed if you wanted to get a quick list of that. So now we're going to talk about eligibility and consent. And usually we communicate with the MA coordinator or the MA contact at the charter school or school using our MA billing service um, with this information. So when you purchase our billing service, every month SPED Forms does an eligibility check on all students at your school. Or if it is a new student to the school and you want to know whether you need to document the evaluation, you can contact Kelly or Tanya and we can look that student up quick for you. Um, just note that there may be a delay because some students have multiple Medicaid numbers. This started happening just prior to COVID, I believe, when parents would go in and re reapply or when they first had the online application, um, parents were getting brand new numbers or students technically were getting brand new numbers instead of um, keeping that one same MH. CPID. Know that SPED forms will never contact the parent. The school is responsible for getting consent. If parents have questions, um, we, we always get asked, what do we tell the parent? We don't know anything about MA. There are just a few things that you can tell the parent. One is, this is required. Schools are required to bill. MDE began citing districts or schools, charter schools, for not billing, I think in the mid-2000s, late 2000s. Um, I believe in fiscal year 23, the $48 million was received by school districts in the state of Minnesota. So it's beneficial. And that $48 million is a separate pot of federal money. IEP claims do not affect the parental fees or any lifetime limits of any other services that the parents or students receive outside of school. So we're required to, and it doesn't affect um, any of their parental fees or other services. Additionally, any revenue that we do get, that $48 million, is additional money that stays in special education. That's the only requirement um, for the school once they receive this money, is it has to stay in special education. If a signed consent to share data is received, um, claims can be billed immediately. And we'll talk a little bit more about that informed consent process on the next slide. If the parent does sign a physical consent form, the school can update the MA billing setup right away. They would just go to the MA billing setup and check yes for the consent to share data. Or you can let Kelly or Tanya know if you're in a rush and you just, I got a couple of consent forms, these kids. Please, if you email us, do not list the student's full name and MA number saying I got MA consent. Use initials and the last few digits of the MARS ID. If you upload that signed consent form to the history, to the student's history, remember to designate it as a medical document so that way the form does not transfer to the next school. 
the consent is only good for the school that receives it. Also, marking it medical will prevent it from being viewed by other educators that do not have MA permissions. After one year, if claims are entered for a student and the school has not updated the consent question or told us that consent was received, Kelly and I will review, mostly Kelly recently, will review the student's history to determine when the notice of procedural safeguards was provided to the parent and we can begin using informed consent. That is sufficient for MDE DHS for consent in order to bill. We've included a link to the MDE website regarding the consent process. We do have a couple of exceptions. So if you are with Cornerstone Montessori, Hennepin Elementary, Natawash Community School, New Millennium, they have required paper consent. Consent on a case-by-case -case basis, Cyber Village and Sage Academy, um, we, before we bill, we will contact the district the MA contact at the district and ask if it's okay to bill using informed. So now we're going to take a look at a couple of reports. Um, and this is for directors and special education directors. So the big thing that the uh, one of the main reports that SPED Forms MA Billing Service does is that annual rates report that's due to DHS July 5th every year. In the past, it used to be a paper form that we would have to print, send to the director, they would have to physically sign it, send it back to us so we could submit it. We now do that online, so we will send a copy of that report to the director and submit the data online um, to DHS. When we send that data to DHS, it's only the number of encounters per service and the amount of time. The rest of the information that DHS gets to set rates comes from CEDRA. So this is a report when we have to set rates for new districts or a new service, or if for some reason the rates seem odd when we get them from DHS, we look at CEDRA. And this is probably the most common reason that revenue gets recouped um, from schools is because the CEDRA information is incorrect. They may have used all federal dollars to pay for a service provider, for that speech therapist, for the OT. Because the rate that we are getting paid we do only get half of the rate. So if your rate is $30, we only get about 15, a little more than 15. Um, we are getting paid the federal share. So DHS assumes the rest of that is coming from state aids, which is on CEDRA. So again, the, in, the same number of hours that we bill for that much or more needs to be included in CEDRA. So the previous report here, these hours have to be recorded into CEDRA, at least that much or more. Um, I've included a link to the Minnesota funding reports if you want to double check um, what your business manager has inputted into CEDRA. Um, just note, CEDRA is closing November 30th, so for fiscal year 23, which was last school year, your business managers are finalizing all of the costs associated with PT, OT, speech, nursing, mental health, personal care, and interpreter. So verify that they have all of that information for those staff in CEDRA. One of the other questions we get is who's eligible 
Um, we will not send you list of eligible students. Um, obviously, due to HIPAA, we don't want to send you, hey, these are all the Medicaid kids. You can use the services report to find eligible students that are receiving services. Um, SPED forms, if you use our MA billing service, um, we mainly are here to submit your claims once they're entered into MA forms. We don't police your providers and double check to make sure they're documenting. If there happens to be a big swing in the number of claims, we're going to take a look and see why. Or maybe if all of a sudden you don't have any claims, um, we will take a look and see why. Once you go to admin reporting and click on the services report, you may not have noticed, but as a special ed director, you have MA access and you have the option to search for MA eligible students um, on that services report. And again, you can go ahead and click search and look for your OTPT speech students um, and see if they are MA eligible in that list. So, for directors, one of the big things is change in staff. So if there are any changes in providers or the directors, special ed directors, please let us know. Um, we don't want to be sending information to a director and they're no longer at the school. So let us know any changes in staff. SPED forms will set your rates or adjust your rates if needed. SPED forms will add the MA eligible filter for providers there if for some reason you do want to require your providers to document on everybody, just go ahead and let us know that as well. SPED forms will complete the excluded provider list for the staff that are entered into SPED forms. If you are billing for PCAs and you go in and enter C paper log, and the PCAs don't have an account in SPED forms, go ahead and enter their name in this PCA provider list. All you have to enter is their first and last name, and then that gets checked against the excluded provider list. Um, you might also have contracted nurses that you might be doing that with go ahead and enter those um, the first and last name of nurses or any other contracted providers um, as well. And then monthly, we check that excluded provider list for you. SPED forms is never going to share a student with a provider. If we get an email and a provider says, hey, I have a new student coming in, I need access to them so I can um, start my evaluation we won't give them, we don't know who the provider is, who the student is, but as long as that provider is shared with a student, we can give them MA access as your billing, um, as your billing consultant. SPED forms is not going to review the licensure of your providers. We check the excluded provider list, but we don't verify that they have the correct DHS licensure or is it Pelsby, call it Pelsby, um, MDE licensure, or if a speech therapist has their C's. So that's the responsibility of the school to do that. SPED forms does not specifically audit documentation. Um, in the course of our billing, if we find something that looks incorrect to us, we'll contact the provider, the MA coordinator, or contact at the school, or the directors if need be. So our contact information, Kelly with a Y, is another MA billing specialist, myself, Tanya, and Kelly Burns, Kelly with an I, is still your SPED forms contact for all other non-related, MA-related questions. Here is a list of the schools that are on the 1000 server that use our MA billing service and the schools on the 1001 server. 
Um, just a couple of questions that were reviewed when we did this live training. Um, we have those noted here that I believe I did address um, in the video. There is one that I just noticed here now. Should parents sign the consent to share data or the parental consent form, or are they interchangeable? They're technically interchangeable. However, the consent to share data is also available on the SPED forms menu because it doesn't contain the MA number or the private insurance information. It also is one page, easier to read, rather than the parental consent form, which is two, three pages, has two, three places for the parent to sign. It might be a little confusing. Um, I think that is it. Again, any questions, if you are a school using our MA billing service, we will go ahead and add them to the list here. If you have any questions about the MA process as an MA service provider, the MA coordinator contact at the school district, or a director or special education director, go ahead and contact Kelly with a Y at spedforms.com or Tanya at spedforms.com. Thank you so much.